Well, hey there, it's Liz Rohr from Real World NP, and you're watching NP Practice Made Simple, the weekly videos to help save you time, frustration, and help you learn faster so you can take the best care of your patients. So today I'm going to be talking about cellulitis and erysipelas. I have to <laughs> think about that pronunciation every single time. Um, but yeah, so I'm going to be talking about that presentation, and I really want to focus on... Um, I want to backtrack and say that I have been precepting nurse practitioners for uh, almost five years now, and I, I currently mentor um, several new nurse practitioners in primary care. And I have to say that nurse practitioners as a whole, as they're uh, new into practice, it's, it's overwhelming. It's a lot of responsibility. Um, and I, they are very bright and they have great resources. And most of the time, what we're doing when we're talking together is putting those pieces together and forming kind of those clinical judgment decisions um, that you can't really get from textbooks. So that's what I kind of want to focus on in this video today is talking about what are the, what is the kind of like foundation, some foundational knowledge about cellulitis, but also the clinical decision-making of how it really applies in real world practice. Cause that's what I'm here for, right? Real world, uh, NP practice. So yeah, so some clinical manifestations of cellulitis. So um, and erysipelas. You want to think about um, this is probably not news to you, but just as a recap, disclaimer actually before I get started into the clinical manifestations is that there are many types of cellulitis, and so periorbital cellulitis has very specific things you want to think about when it comes to assessment, when it comes to treatment. Um, and additionally, there are other types of uh, less common places of getting cellulitis. So somebody who has um, a, a larger BMI, who has a panis, gets paniculitis, um, things like that. Like those are very kind of unique situations to investigate further. Primarily what I'm focusing on here has to do with lower extremity cellulitis, because that's like the main one that I see in primary care, may also apply to upper extremity as well. But anyway, so just using your clinical judgment and listening to your gut when it comes to specific types of cellulitis that are less common presentations. But anyway, so I'm generally focusing on lower extremity cellulitis because that's the most common cause. So some clinical manifestations is it's usually the unilateral um, uh, one-sided uh, edema, warmth, uh, whether it's like slightly warm to hot and uh, erythema. And I want to make a note that um, there's different skin tones for patients, right? So there's that Fitzpatrick scale, that one to six, that talks about, um, you know, uh, darker versus lighter skin, like all the way up the scale. So depending on the baseline skin tone of the patient, it's going to appear differently, right? So in patients who have a, a five or six skin tone or darker skin tone, they might appear as hyperpigmentation. So definitely don't um, miss out on that for sure. And that um, it's not talked about, I think, enough. Um, um, versus if you have a very light skin tone, I, I believe I have type one, um, for me, it would be a very, uh, like a brighter red color, uh, potentially. Um, and so, um, you might also see things like petechiae, superficial bullae, and I never say that right, those <laughs> large blisters. Um, you also may see vesicles, the smaller blisters, as well as ecchymoses sometimes. I don't see that as often, but I definitely do see the bullae and the um, vesicles for sure. Um, you may or may not see fever in patients. It tends to correlate with more clinically ill patients when they have a fever um, or things like tachycardia or hypotension. Um, if you happen to see that, those patients are a lot more ill and likely need hospitalization. And then um, when it comes to erysipelas versus um, cellulitis, erysipelas is more of a superficial um, uh, uh, skin infection, whereas the cellulitis goes deeper into the, uh, towards the fat tissue. And for erysipelas, you might see a more rapid onset, brighter, um, more intense symptoms, and you might see edema of the skin and that peau d'orange appearance, like the um, orange peel, uh, because of the follicles, because of the edema, and like sharp demarcation. Um, that's a little bit more consistent with that. I see that less often, quite honestly, than the cellulitis. And then when it comes to um, the assessment and the treatment, um, cellulitis really breaks down into purulent versus non-purulent. And there's kind of different treatment pathways depending on which one you're talking about, if there's any discharge, drainage, things like that, or an abscess. Really important to assess is if there's any fluctuants. So when you're pressing down um, with gloves on, on top of the, uh, of the area, you're not getting any of that fluctuant sensation because those patients may need incision and drainage. They might need some, some other types of treatment. I'm not really getting into abscess in this video. A couple other things I just want to talk about when it comes to cellulitis and the conversations that I typically have with newer clinicians. Um, a couple things to think about. So one is risk factors. Another one is whether or not they need hospitalization. Um, 
choosing the antibiotics and then um, the type of like kind of real world management. So just to jump in, that's the rest of the stuff I'm going to talk about in this video. So um, risk factors. So there's a number of risk factors to think about, which will really inform your um, plan going forward. So where did this come from? So did somebody fall and they have a trauma to the area and then it became infected? Do they have an underlying skin condition like eczema, psoriasis, um, things like that? Um, do they have edema in their lower extremities because of um, uh, you know, lymphatic, impaired lymphatic drainage, venous insufficiency? Um, are they immunosuppressed in a way, like with diabetes or HIV or cancer, things like that? Um, a really uh, a, an additional risk factor is obesity, and I, I can't speak to the um, to the to the actual like mechanism of action there. Maybe just like a correlation that's been noted, um, and a really kind of sneaky pearl one, which you may have heard before, is um, tinea. So having tinea pedis in between the toes, um, onychomycosis in the toenails, those are definitely risk factors for the development of a bacterial skin infection, a cellulitis. So things to think about, like what are those risk factors? So not only that helps you in, helps inform the history and like what the steps further are, like was it just an injury? The injury is going to heal. You treat the, uh, treat the cellulitis and it goes away versus they have diabetes um, and tinea pedis. Do you want to treat them uh, for the tinea? And then you also want to think about um, does that increase their risk for a more severe infection? So those are the main things when it comes to risk factors, which really ties into this question of do they need hospitalization or not? So I wanna give a patient an example here. So when I was a newer grad, I think I had a couple months of experience. I don't remember exactly how, much, how long, but I had a patient, um, a white male, 60-ish uh, year, uh, year old man, and he had diabetes. Uh, who's, and his A1C was about in the 10 to 12 range, uh, 10 to 12 percent persistently. He also had lower extremity edema um, on and off, uh, just idiopathic. We've worked it up and it was kind of just there. Chronic venous insufficiency was probably the likely cause. He's like, oh, can you just take a look at my foot real quick? Um, I, I fell and I stumbled and I stubbed my toe. Um, I was like, okay, that's fine. He took his off his shoes. He takes off his socks. He rolls up his pant leg. Um, and he had very like light skin. And so he light colored uh, undertone of his skin. And he had a very bright red foot all the way up to his mid shin. And he had uh, a clear injury at his toe and he had diabetes and um, it was very hot. Uh, it was swollen. It was very red. And he, um, it was malodorous too. Like there was, there was some kind of smell coming from the, from the injury. And so, um, so I knew that he had some sort of bacterial infection needed treatment. Um, but I just had this gut sensation of, this is a lot of, I see this a lot in newer clinicians where it's kind of, it's a little bit overwhelming to be a new provider, regardless of nurse practitioner or otherwise, when you go to see a patient, um, you're really focused on the symptoms, the history, the assessment, diagnosis, the plan, the treatment. It's kind of hard not to get swept away by that. And so very easily you could say that this patient needs antibiotics, um, but it's really important to take that pause. And I, and I had this pause of like this gut sensation of like, oh, okay, like I probably should have somebody else look at this. This looks, this looks really severe. So, um, and his vital signs were stable. He had no fever. He felt fine aside from being in some pain uh, in his foot. And I pulled my colleague and my uh, supervisor at the time, and they agreed very heartily that he needed hospitalization. And so um, so yeah, I mentioned that just because I, I remember that, that feeling of kind of, um, just, it, it's just hard. It's hard being a new provider. So that's something to think about is one in your decision tree, right? Hospitalization or not. And there isn't really a hard and fast like rule, but it's kind of more along the lines of how severe is it? What are their risk factors again? Do they have um, fever, tachycardia, hypotension, um, extremes of age, like things like that, um, to really inform your decision. So, um, so yeah, so looking at the risk factors, the symptoms, whether or not they need hospitalization, the last kind of like two to three things I want to talk about um, is like the decision tree of treatment. So if it's safe to keep them outpatient, um, you want to consult um, whatever resource you use to, to help with this. And so there's a variety of resources, but um, I particularly love Sanford Antimicrobial Guide, and I'm not affiliated with them in any way. I just use it myself. Um, and it's about $30 a year, and you can uh, search on their app by type of infection include their allergies, include their risk factors and their recommendations for which antibiotic for how long, et cetera, et cetera. There are other ones out there, but that's the one that I use the most. And thinking about like, do you need to treat for MRSA versus, uh, versus for resistant um, and uh, bacteria versus not? 
Um, yeah. And then in terms of like the real world implications, again, another thing that I had to catch myself doing as a new nurse practitioner, as a newer provider, is that um, it's very easy to say, you know, I've made that decision. They're safe to go outpatient. Let's just give them an antibiotic and go. But really, we have to still exercise a lot of caution with these patients. And so generally speaking, I'll bring my patients back in the first 24 to 48 hours of starting antibiotics to monitor the progression and see if it's getting better or if it's getting worse always giving those alarm signs in between of like, if you develop any of these alarming things, then please seek care or please contact the clinic. Um, and typically um, this is consensus practice of, of that close follow-up, but also doing an outline um, of the area, right? Um, with a skin marking pen to make sure that um, it's not extending beyond those margins. Um, because if it is, then those patients actually might need IV antibiotics instead of oral uh, therapy, or they might need an antibiotic change. But typically if it's extending within that period of time, I'll typically refer them for um, uh, hospitalization for assessment for IV antibiotics. And it depends on, on the type of infection and the risk factors. like if they even need to be admitted or if they just uh, stay for a couple of doses of antibiotics. So, so yeah. And then the last thing I just want to wrap with, I started with kind of things to watch out for in terms of periorbital cellulitis is a little bit different. <laughs> You're not necessarily going to mark around the eye. There's some other considerations, right? And there's, there's also a wide differential base as well as alarm signs and symptoms to watch out for in addition to the ones that I've already mentioned. So things like crepitus, if it appears gangrenous, <laughs> like if they seem unstable, I'm trusting your clinical judgment here to like look at a patient and be able to, to see those things, but just definitely things to keep in mind. A couple of sneaky ones that will present as um, uh, similarly to a cellulitis, a lower extremity cellulitis in particular, drug reactions, gout, uh, erythema migrans, especially if it has central clearing, because the erysipelas can have that um, central clearing sometimes. Um, herpes, again, can have those little vesicles. Um, and then osteomyelitis. So, so to, to kind of go back to that patient, I sent him to the ER and he got admitted and he was there for actually a couple of months because he ended up having um, uh, an osteomyelitis. He needed an amputation. He needed long-term IV antibiotics. He actually ended up on uh, in renal failure because of a variety of things, but um, but yeah, so that's definitely a risk factor that you want to think about. Um, uh, also, contact dermatitis, DVTs, stasis dermatitis, insect bites, and then another one is a uh, so those are things to think about. Not comprehensive, of course, so definitely utilize your resources. Um, but animal bites um, are are another separate category. Those have very particular things to think about too. So anyway, that is hopefully like a primer in cellulitis or a refresher in cellulitis. Um, but definitely consult with your resources to get that full picture, and always consult if you have any questions because I still consult too, especially if you're not sure to send somebody to the ER or not, especially if they don't have insurance, they don't want to go. There's COVID, you know, so um, there's no, there's no harm. There's no shame in, in consulting with other people to make sure that you're really kind of given the best care for your patients. So if you have not gotten your copy of the ultimate resource guide for the new NP, head over to realworldnp.com slash guide. It's my favorite resources, all the ones that I use um, in my day-to-day -day practice in primary care. You'll also get these videos sent straight to your inbox every week with notes from me, patient stories, and bonus content that I really just don't share anywhere else. Thank you again so much for watching. Hang in there and I'll see you soon.